Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another session. And again, this week, we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Tay, um, no relative of mine, or so we, we don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, so Dr. Tay is a hand and a microsurgeon. He is an IMU grad, and um, he was previously with University Hospital as a professor, lecturer, and uh, he's been with Sunway for the last six years. Okay, um, we are sorry, uh, we'd like to apologize, but um, so about last week, Dr. Tay could not make it. So we're having the talk this week and we will give one CPD point at the end of it. And this, um, I will display the QR code. And if you want to actually scan the QR code, you must scan it with your handphone while watching on your laptop. If you're watching from your handphone, you can't scan. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let us invite Dr. Tay to maybe share his slides and start the talk. Mm -hmm. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you everyone for joining us in this webinar. Thank you, Betty, for inviting me. Um, first of all, I would like to apologize that I couldn't make it last minute from last week. Um, so I'm just going to start my slide now, I'm just going to share. So, so we're going to talk about, can you all see my slides? Yes, can. Yeah. Maybe you pre, uh, yeah. yes. Wait. Okay. So, so we are going to talk about, I'm just going to share my, 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 my thoughts about uh, some hand, common hand conditions. So they are, Okay, this is our unit in uh, the second floor of Sunway Medical Center. This is our hand and microsurgery unit. There are three of us, the three hand surgeons in the unit. Um, so this is a talk, the content of my talk today. Um, there are two parts, part one and part two, because I think I have some 200 over slides to, to present, but uh, they are pretty easy and they, they, they are just mainly photos of or images of my patients or some, some diagrams I take from the internet. So part one would be on nerve problems, tendon problems, bony problems. And well, I think yesterday there was a request in the telegram to talk about ulnar collateral ligament injury or skier's thumb. Um, I will stop halfway. And if uh, we don't take up too much time, we can, if, if there's still time, we can go into part two to talk about the rest. All right. So first stop, nerve problems. Um, so the most common um, things I, disease I see in the clinic is carpal tunnel syndrome. I am sure this is the most common uh, cause of hand numbness that you see in your practice as well, if you are a general practitioner. So what are the symptoms? Usually the pain um, and numbness is over the hand, over the thumb, index, middle, and sometimes patient can tell you half of my ring finger. Uh, not everyone can tell you that. Sometimes it's worse at, and sometimes it's worse at night uh, because of the sleeping position. And you know, you, you, it can be worse when you hold up a newspaper to read, when you're driving cars, when you're knitting or doing stuff with your hands. So this is a diagram to show where the symptoms are. This is uh, um, the area that, that causes the numbness. And sometimes patients also complain there's pain around the wrist. So this is just the anatomy of the carpal tunnel. So the carpal tunnel is made up of um, the bones of the cup, the couple bones on the, on the, on the, as the floor of the carpal tunnel. And then you have the uh, transverse carpal ligament on top, which is the roof of the carpal tunnel. And, this little tunnel here has to transmit nine tendons and one nerve called the median nerve. All right. In carpal tunnel syndrome, this area can be swollen and the increased pressure causes the um, compression of the nerve, causing the irritation and, and, and trouble to the nerve. In long-term carpal tunnel syndrome, you get tina muscle wasting. You don't treat it early. You get weakness of the thumb. And this is called a Simon thumb. So the monkeys doesn't have a uh, thumb like us. They cannot abduct the thumb uh, and therefore you lose function. 
So Mom, how to make a thumb? thumb? Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, this is the Simon thumb. So if you go to the to the just to elaborate, yeah, just if you go to the zoo, uh -huh. if you look at the monkeys with uh, tails, they don't have this muscle. Um, only the great apes like us, the orangutans, the gorilla, the chimpanzees have this, and therefore we can use our thumb to abduct. Uh, and hold a pen and, and, and use uh, tools and equipment. So actually, if you have, if you are a monkey jumping from, from, uh, from uh, tree to tree, this muscle is actually dangerous because you can actually uh, fracture your thumb or you get a ulnar collateral ligament injury like um, which I'm going to talk about in the short uh, after uh, after this. So but how do you make a diagnosis? You do that by eliciting some TNL signs um, where you hit, the, you, you tap the, the, the median nerve over the wrist, balance sign, Durkin's test. I'm not going to go through this in details. I, I hope you, okay. you, you know, people can read this up and most of the people who are here probably already done this in their practice every day. And then you can do nerve conduction study. And there's a new way to do this. Uh, people are doing using carpal tunnel questionnaire. I, I, I use that in my practice because not every patient needs a nerve conduction study. And some, some of us who, who don't work in a tertiary hospital uh, can't, get to, can't get a nerve conduction study. And um, the, the, the specificity and sensitivity of a nerve conduction study is pretty low. It's, as on, it's only as high as the tinnels and phalanx uh, and they can test uh, sensitivity and specificity. So a lot of times there is no need to do uh, uh, nerve conduction study if the, the test is, the, the, the clinical signs are typical of a carpal tunnel syndrome. So how do we treat um, carpal tunnel syndrome? So we can always divide most um, such, um, treatment into conservative. Uh, we can do steroid injection, conservative, we talk about splint and therapy and lastly surgery, that's, that's where I come in. Uh, you have the conventional open carpal tunnel release or the endoscopic carpal tunnel release. So how does, so some of the things that I tell my patients, uh, what, and some, some of the things that I want to share here is the things I tell my patients and explain to them why, why do I get, you know, patients often ask, why, why do I get a numbness right in the morning or, or during the sleep? If you look at the wrist, when you are sleeping, your, your wrist is in all sorts of position, usually in a flex position. And that makes the tunnel tighter and, 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 and narrower. And that impinge on the nerve further. And this is how you do a, a phalanx test when you purposely bend the, the wrist in that position and it decreases the pressure around the, 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 the tunnel. If you, if you bend it and you do it in less than one minute and patient complaining of numbness, then you know that most probably that's a, a positive sign and that's due to that. So you don't want your wrist in this extreme position. So if you are using a computer and your wrist is in extended position for a prolonged period of time, that can also increases, increase the, the, the pressure. So this is how you should keep your wrist in a neutral position like that and in a, in a position that is in uh, comfort. But um, who can keep this wrist stagnant like this for, for hours, especially during sleep. So how do you do that? You, you give them a splint. So one of the problems with splints are not, not all the splints are suitable. Actually, most of the splints are not suitable. This is a custom-made carpal tunnel splint. If you look at the over-the-counter type uh, wrist splint, the, the wrist is put in a 45, 30, 30, 30 degrees dorsal angulation. Or, or, or extension. This is the most comfortable uh, uh, position of your wrist in a normal wrist. But in carpal tunnel syndrome, you don't want your wrist in this position. You want your wrist in a neutral position. And, and therefore, this may not help your patient. All right, this may actually increase the, 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 the pressure at night and uh, impinge the nerve further throughout the eight hours of sleep. So we normally will custom make the spleen and the spleen, you know, the, the wrist can be put in neutral position like this. 
Then you can do nerve gliding exercises. These are the steps to do them. Uh, I have a video on my Facebook page if you want to have a look or download it. Uh, you can visit our page. So lastly, if those things fail, you can give you can also give steroid injection, but steroid injection are not a real treatment. It's basically to buy time. And usually we give it, I only give it to patients who we think has very early carpal tunnel syndrome or patients who have transient causes for carpal tunnel syndrome like pregnancy or breastfeeding mothers. Because when you are pregnant and when you are you are breastfeeding, that period of time of uh, increased uh, edema, increased swelling of the body and wrist are uh, temporary. And by buying time, of, of uh, pregnancy, you deliver your baby, the edema comes down, swelling comes down, um, things will be all right. Um, so basically, uh, steroid injection is mainly for those type of patients. But if you are in your 50s or 60s and you have had this for more than six, six months, you have tried uh, conservative treatment like uh, therapy and splints and it fails, then most likely you will need surgery. So surgery, this is open carpal tunnel uh, release. It uh, can be done under local anesthesia. You don't need to put the patient to sleep. You make a four to five centimeters wound over the palm. You release the carpal tunnel and voila, the patient after the day three, when they come back for, from uh, surgery, they will tell you my nerve pain, my numbness, my shoulder pain, my neck pain is gone. All right. So it looks gory, and, but this is an effective uh, treatment for, for, for carpal tunnel syndrome. So for patients who don't like open carpal tunnel or don't like a big scar like this, we have endoscopic carpal tunnel release. So I'm going to share with you um, uh, a new technique called the supraretinacular endoscopic carpal tunnel release. So how is this different from, this is actually a new technique. Um, I have a pattern for, for the surgical instrument, uh, for, uh, for, for pattern for the surgical technique and instrumentation. So this we make a two centimeter wound at the, at the wrist. We tunnel, uh, we make a space between the, the, the skin and above the retinaculum. That's why it's called the supra retinacular uh, endoscopic carpal tunnel release. Um, the old technique, we, they insert the, the, the scope inside the tunnel, which is already narrow. So we do not, I don't do that in, 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 in this new technique. We put it above the, uh, uh, retinaculum. If we, if I may, I just go back to the it, diagram here. So in the old technique, the 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 scope is put inside the tunnel, and with the new technique, we put it above the tunnel. So imagine if this is already very tight, and then you in you put a, a scope into here with the instrumentation, you are likely to injure the median nerve. And therefore, in around the world, people don't like to do uh, uh, endoscopic carpal tunnel release for that reason, especially in our old ladies who, who, who probably only have a, a glove size of five or six. So this uh, supraretinacular technique um, allows us to put in uh, a, 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 the, the scope without uh, putting the nerve at risk. And uh, this is how we cut it. This is uh, laparoscopic scissors. The, this scissors looks big, but it's actually only 3.5 millimeter. And that's the median nerve down there. That's the fat pad sign. That's the end of the carpal tunnel. And we see the, the carpal tunnel, the, uh, the median nerve being uh, fully so released. Basically, a lot of time it's just fat tissues. Uh, no, um, not fat tissue, but a lot of edema. A lot of times uh, you can have edema in the, in the carpal tunnel, um, especially if you are pregnant and stuff. And then as if you are of uh, uh, menopausal women or, or, or men who use their wrist to do a lot of heavy job, the retinaculum is thickened and uh, stiff. And I describe this, the, the way I describe to my patient is, you know, imagine you suddenly gain 20 kilos 
uh, you're wearing the same shirt and now the shirt that you wear is, or the pants you wear is no more the yoga pants or you have a very old yoga pants that doesn't stretch properly anymore. And so the retinaculum is very thickened and very, uh, not uh, uh, stretchable anymore. So then the treatment is to, to either lose weight by doing therapy, by giving you steroids and stuff like that. And if that fails, or the swelling is so much, or the, the weight gain is so much, your weight loss regime is not going to be adequate, then all you need to do is to cut the, the shirt open or, 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 or cut the pants open. And this is uh, cutting the retinaculum open. So you release it, and that's three or, four, three or four stitches around the wrist. There's about two centimeter wound. So you do not need to cut this part, all right? So... The, I believe the return to work time is uh, shorter and also patients will really like your, your, the, 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 the scar compared to the old scar that they have. So this is a study um, that we made uh, just recently been accepted for publication about a month ago by Journal of Hand Surgery uh, America. And this is the graph to show the grip strength of 48 of our, we did, 50 patients in UM when I was still there. And um, this is the grip strength of all the, the, the patients, uh, the mean uh, pinch grip. So the first, the first graph, this is the uh, grip strength. So pre-op, 12.1 uh, kilos. Post-op, of course, it drops immediately at day three to four and slowly uh, uh, increases over time. And if you look at this, at three months post-op, it's already better than, than pre-op grip strength. Second is uh, pinch grip. So again, uh, sorry, this is pinch grip. The second graph here is uh, modified table test. So one of the problems with, uh, with carpal tunnel release is uh, you get some carpal bones instability after you release the retinaculum. So by... The, that can cause uh, problems when you press on the table and cause instability. And again, um, if you see this at three months, patients are already doing better than, than pre-op. And same thing with pinch grip is already be is better after uh, than pre-op at three months. But it drops after on day three, but then it slowly increases over time. So that's one measure. The second measure is uh, visual analog score. So average VAS pre-op is 6.3, immediately post-op with a, with a wound, wound in the wrist, and uh, you think that the VAS will be much higher. It's not. The VAS is so much better at 2.4, and it slowly uh, uh, improves over time some more. And this 0 0.52 is actually uh, of one just one patient, uh, not from the pain over the wrist, but pain over the arm because... Uh, patient, that, that was the third or second or third patient of mine uh, in the series where uh, we have some problems with the, with the tourniquet rather than uh, uh, the surgery itself. So the pain is mainly due to tourniquet rather than uh, the surgical techniques. Sorry, Ate. Um, yep. For somebody who doesn't know what VAS stands for, can you okay. explain this? Sure. So v VAS uh, stands for uh, visual analog score. So you 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 tell the patient um, you have uh, this is a pain score zero being uh, no pain nice. at all, yeah. and ten being uh, the pain that uh, you're gonna die in type of pain. So may, mainly that's how the patient will report. This is a self reported uh, uh, score. So patient will tell you what. Well, what you score. Quite high, uh, a pain score for copper tunnel. Sorry. 6.3 is quite high a pain score for yeah. carpal tunnel. Yes, it can be really uh, bad. I, I, most of our patients, I have to tell you, um, in UM, the series that we have, uh, amazingly can have a conservative treatment of carpal tunnel syndrome for years before they, they decided they yeah, want Yeah, because I, I take it very possibly. lightly when patients complain, you know, and I know it's carpal tunnel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just say, okay, it's just carpal tunnel. Always, it is just carpal tunnel. Yeah. And I don't do much to it, you know? Yep, yep. Yeah. I think most people are like that. Most doctors uh, do that. And actually, some patients that we tell them, they, they, if they have mild symptoms, they will not want surgery. But uh, again, um, these are things that uh, we can show why, 
why surgery actually works. All right? And our community is that such that they believe the, the acupuncture needle and the massage and whatnot rather than uh, seeing us. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the next score is the DASH score. This is a functional score. Again, it's a self-reporting uh, score where you answer some questions about functional function of your hand. Pre-op, you can see uh, score is 4.1, uh, 4.41.66. Post-op day three is, is worse off because of course your hand is in a bandage. I, I, you know, I tell you not to use your hand so much, don't get it wet, so they can't do a lot of things. So the score uh, increases, but on day seven, you can see it's already better than pre-op. So that's one week, it's already better than pre-op, even though the stitch has not been removed and stitch is only removed at two weeks, and you can see that the, the functional score actually just comes out. All right, and this is the Boston Carpal Tunnel score. It's consistent. Uh, BTQS is a symptomatic score, and uh, you see the symptomatic scores improve immediately. Uh, functional score worsen on day three, but just, just gets better with time. And we know that um, the, the, the pain and the, the, uh, the function and, 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 and pain score improves up to about six months before they flatten off. But we don't have numbers. We don't have uh, data after six months because that's, that's the longest uh, time we followed up with these patients. So just show you one of my patient's video. This is a patient of mine who had uh, uh, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. One side was uh, operated on by another surgeon in Joho uh, with open carpal tunnel release and the other side was uh, uh, by endoscopic uh, technique. Uh, she came to see me. Uh, interestingly, this is one of those rare patients who come into my clinic and say, uh, I want surgery. I said, huh? What surgery do you want? Yeah, I have, you see, my, I have already had this surgery on this hand. Can you do surgery on the other hand? Uh, uh, the other hand. And uh, he said, she said, What's wrong with this uh, op this uh, surgery on the on the right hand that you had? She said, "I don't like the scar. I can you make the scar smaller, uh, like more at my neighbor had." So this is her at two weeks after surgery, and can y'all hear that? No, I don't think I can hear. Can you hear? I can hear, but can y'all hear? No, I can't hear anything. Okay. So, so basically, I was trying to... I, I'm talking, speaking to her in Mandarin because she, she's uh, Mandarin speaking. So this is two months old uh, scar. I see. Uh, this is two weeks old scar. This, this, this is her at two weeks uh, coming to clinic for removal of stitches. And you can see she put some iodine on the, on the wound, which uh, I told her there's no need to, but she, she did it anyway. Okay. So I removed the stitches on day 14. This is two months after operation. So um, so I was trying to ask her which one is more painful. And I was palpating this area here. And she said the pain over the palm is the same. This is two months, this is two weeks. So you think that two months old uh, uh, scar would be much less painful than the two weeks old scar. So um, that's what I'm trying to get at. So, so you think uh, an endoscopic technique will, will allow the patient to go back to function and, and, and pain, pain free a bit earlier than uh, uh, the open carpal tunnel technique. Lah, that's all. So if you look at the scar, this is really, you, know, you can see this, you, there's no scar there. It's still a bit swollen because of the, the surgery two weeks ago. Okay, next step, next uh, Pathology, cubital tunnel syndrome. So this is, just now we were talking about median nerve. So this is the ulnar nerve. So the pain and numbness is over the ring and little, half, uh, half of the ring and, and, and mainly the little finger. This may radiate up to the elbow and neck as well. And uh, a lot of times patient will come with a uh, loss of grip and clawing of the hand. Uh, they cannot abduct and adduct their, fi their, their fingers properly. They will drop stuff. Actually, I just did one surgery this morning, at least uh, today on a patient like this with a cubital tunnel syndrome. He was a tire man and he uses his uh, uh, arm to, to do a lot of heavy work. And there was also some osteoarthritis of the, the, the elbow. And so the, 
the osteophytes over the elbow was impinging on the nerve and the ulnar nerve. So usually a patient will complain, this is where the pain, the numbness is and the pain goes up all the way up here. And if they tap around here, there'll be a lot of pain running down the, the fingers and, and, and you, that's the tinel sign from the, the ulnar nerve at the cubital tunnel uh, area. Again, you can do a, a nerve conduction study, um, but a lot of times you will find that uh, you can have signs like this. This is a um, ulnar claw. You ask the patient to extend the fingers and they cannot, and this, these two fingers are already uh, clawed. So what are the risk factors? Prolonged elbow flexion, some osteoarthritis of the elbow like the patient that I, I, I operated on this afternoon. Um, so what are the treatment? Uh, splint. So I actually have a patient who, who was a young girl. She was only 12 or 14. You know, I, cannot, I don't remember wrongly. Her father is an ENT surgeon. One day she turned up in clinic and uh, with uh, this claw hand. On a claw, and we were like, "Uh oh, what is going on? Um, does she have some tumor, or she has something that is compressing the, the nerve on the on in the neck?" We scanned her, did everything, nothing came back, all negative, which was a good thing. And uh, so the, the I asked her, I said, "No, uh, can you tell me if you do any of your hobbies that you do, uh, um, you know, that you have to bend your elbow for a prolonged period of time?" Initially, she said no. Um, then subsequently, and she came back uh, with, uh, after the scans is all negative, we treated it with uh, conservatively with splint. Um, she improved. And uh, on the follow-up, she told us, oh, I was uh, watching YouTube the whole time for about you know, the, the period of the long, long, long school holiday. She was watching t YouTube like you know, six to seven hours at a, time, at a day with the elbow flexed on the hard table, uh, supporting the chin. <laughs> yeah. That's how I used to do, watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, I thought that was, that was the only time. Uh, Radio. Radio. Okay, sorry, uh, can, you, can you mute? Uh, Hello? Okay, 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 sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Um, okay. Okay, so, so, so I thought that was the only time I'm going to see, uh, hear this uh, history. Strange enough, my first few patients in um, Sunway was a man who owns a factory, noodle factory, who also presented with ulnar uh, cubital tunnel syndrome. And I asked him, hey, do, do you do anything that uh, always, you always have to bend your elbow? Initially, he said no. And then the, the wife looked at him and said, no, 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 you do. He said, when? I don't do that. He said, oh, yeah, you were watching the, the Bangla uh, you know, Bangladeshi, you Bangladeshi. and then you will put your head on the <laughs> supporting with your with your hand supporting your head, and then you fall asleep with the elbow flexed. <laughs> so I see that, and um, uh, he got better. <laughs> so treatment is splinting uh, to avoid uh, prolonged elbow flexion. If you use your handphone and talk and talk and talk uh, on the handphone for a prolonged period of time, that's a risk factor as well. Um, so treatment again, splint, um, we can do uh, therapy, we do open release uh, with or without transposition or, and of course we can also do endoscopic release. So this uh, cubital tunnel splint uh, is hideous, it's uh, not something very comfortable because uh, we, we ask you to wear this during sleep and most people will take the uh, spin and throw it back at me and say, nope, this is uh, making me worse because now I can't sleep. So one of the things that I tell patients, you can use a towel to wrap around your elbow and uh, either use a tape to tape it or, or, or safety pin so that uh, uh, there's something in front of your elbow then you cannot flex your elbow so much uh, during sleep. And that actually helps. But uh, if those fails, then we do open uh, release or endoscopic release. So this is a open release with anterior transposition. Um, the scar is about 20 centimeters, uh, 10 centimeters up from the middle epicondyle and 20, 10 centimeters down from the middle epicondyle. So 20 centimeters, and then you bring the, the ulnar nerve to the front and uh, you, you bury in front in the muscle. So we can do that now with, without making such a big wound. This is endoscopic technique. Again, uh, we use a 
a camera to help us release the, the nerve. I don't have video for this, but um, so this is endoscopic. So the one I, the, the patient I did today was we use endoscopic to help release the 10 centimeters and the patient, and, but then I had to transpose the, the nerve anteriorly because there was osteophyte at the, at the, at the cubital tunnel floor. So to avoid, uh, even though after you release the, 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 the osteophytes is still there, you can take it off, but it will grow back and, and that will impinge the nerve again. So safer to bring it to the front and bury in front in the, in the, in the flexor muscles. So that gives the nerve a good bed to, to, to glide in and also a softer bed to, to, to lie on. So then, then the, the symptoms will improve over time. So next, tendon problems. So trigger finger. So this is very common. Uh, patient will complain of pain over the finger, the base of the finger. Uh, they may or may not complain of clicking or less of uh, or unable to flex sometimes. So, and it can also involve multiple fingers. So if you see patients with uh, 10 fingers, uh, uh, trigger finger, don't be surprised because that's what happened to me one time uh, when I was a, a young orthopedic surgeon in, in Ampang many years ago. And one patient turned up with 10 trigger fingers. I was like, huh? This 10, all oh, 10. Yes, all 10. Yes, correct. So I was surprised initially. I was like, it cannot be all 10, right? <laughs> so I was surprised. So I said, mm, okay, never mind. Let's try one finger uh, injection for steroids. And sure enough, with that one injection steroid to uh, a steroid injection to that one particular finger, the finger got so much better. The following two weeks, he just came back and said, no, no, no. Can you please inject all my fingers? <laughs> oh. Uh, so uh, over this, uh, this is because I think they, the, the patient is old, number one. Number two, patient don't seek treatment early. So they just um, in, make the, 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 the symptoms just worsen. If you, if you understand uh, what we call quadriga effect. Quadriga means um, four. Yeah? If, you, if, you, if you look at the Roman uh, horses, the chariots, there are four horses. And if one, the, 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 the four horses are the four fingers. Uh, so they all come from the same muscle, muscle bulb. They, 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 they go through the same couple tunnel. And so all these tendons, once they are swollen, they, 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 can, they can slow down the other function of the head, the fingers, the other tendons as well. And so that increases the risk to all the other fingers. So if you don't treat one, you can just get it. Uh, all the other fingers can get worse. And they also often turn up with trigger finger and carpal tunnel at the same time. Because again, um, you must understand, as we sh I shared before, the tunnel is uh, uh, shared. Uh, the carpal tunnel has to transmit all the tendons and the nerve together. So sometimes the patient will just tell you, I have pain here at the base of my finger, at the base of my thumb. And sometimes if you bother to palpate this area and you when they, they, they bend or, or flex their fingers or thumb, you can actually palpate a nodule. Um, it is uh, really painful. I can tell you uh, that because I actually have a trigger finger now. <laughs> that's you... over, yeah, um, uh, that's because playing too much table tennis over the MCO. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you have pain down here and uh, so, and if you palpate, you can actually feel it. So for grade, there are, there are different grades to trigger finger. The first grade is grade one where you only have pain, but you don't have clicking. So sometimes patients don't tell you they have clicking. So if you have pain on the finger, only pain over the finger and no clicking or jam or whatever, you, you want to think about trigger finger because this is very common. And often not, uh, patients don't get diagnosed in, at stage one. So they, they, don't, they, they go to the doctor, he said, I've seen the doctor, but the doctor told me nothing wrong with my hand. Just gave me some pain, make it ask me to go home but cannot tell me why is it painful. So, so this is one of the differential diagnosis. So if they tell you the pain is here and they have uh, some stiffness of the finger, think about trigger finger, all right? So grade two is when you only have clicking, but you can flex and extend your finger without trouble. And then um, uh, grade three is when you can flex, but you cannot extend uh, on your own. You have to use the other finger or another hand or finger to, to extend it. And then grade four is when you cannot even bend it and uh, there's a PIPJ uh, flexion contracture, that's grade four. 
you can get all this in the in the, in the textbook uh, so i didn't put it up on the slide because things uh, not necessary so how do you treat this uh, i start with stretching exercises um steroid injection and then open release all right so this is a stretching exercise i tell them there are only three steps this is one so you extend all your joints of the finger one two three so there's a metacarpal phalangeal joint uh, PIPJ and DIPJ, you stretch all of them and they should feel some stretching and pain on the uh, A1 pulley area. And this is flexing the metacarpal phalangeal joint, uh, extending the PIP and, and uh, extending the DIPJ. And this is the third step, you flex the PIP and DIP but extend the MCPJ. So these are the three uh, steps. If you look at it, this is can be can be put into a kung fu steps. This is stretching all your fingers, so you 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 um, just push. You know, it's like wu lan in 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 the kung fu language, and this is a uh, This is a snake. If you you if you put all your four fingers together, the se zhao. Then this is the the claw, the the tiger claw. All right, if you put all the fingers together. <laughs> So that's how I tell my patients you do that. And um, you do that. Sometimes the patient likes to ask you, oh, how often do I need to do this? You know, uh, um, so you just give them a number. Lah. So I normally give them, tell them you do 20 sets of this five times a day. And you know, why five times? I said, um, because uh, the Muslim prayers are five times a day. So when they go for prayers, if you are not Muslim, then you do it. If you are Muslim, then you know that that's when you need to do your stretching exercises. So you give them a plan rather than you just tell them go do the exercise and they like uh, well now what do we do when do I do this and you know so they don't do it uh, if you don't give them a regime like that. So we can give you steroid injection as well. So steroid injection is given into the uh, tendon sheath. Um, you have to be very careful. Do not inject into the tendon. And we have patients being injected into the tendon and um, eventually come with a tendon rupture. Right, so do not do that. If you're not sure how to do this, you need to go for some, somebody need to show you how to do it. Don't just push it in. You can poke the, the tendon and uh, cause a tendon rupture. And uh, I have seen that. Um, we I published an article about a patient of mine who had a uh, trigger thumb, who had a uh, needling and um, acupuncture by, by a Chinese acupuncturist and they, he ruptured the, the flexor tendon. She came telling me now I cannot flex my thumb. So I have to do a tendon reconstruction for her. Horrible, horrible, horrible complication for a uh, trigger finger. So this is trigger finger release. This is on the thumb, actually not finger, but uh, more of the thumb. So you, you make a, a, a small cut like this, find a pulley, release the pulley with a plate, and that's the tendon without the pulley and if you see this it takes what uh 10 minutes to do and if you can see this there's a small scar there it's done under la and immediately after the operation this is post this is before so no more no more clicks straight away so if any any Chinese sensei tells uh, the patient tells you, you know, the Chinese sensei can do better than 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 us as a professional profession, tell them that uh, the the surgeon can actually make, take your make your trigger finger go away in ten minutes, and this is a cure. Okay, this is a cure. The most of, I have not seen a patient after release coming back for 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 recurrent trigger finger. Not yet. The next uh, tendon problems is decurrent stenosynovitis. This is a mama's or, 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 or mama hen. So it's pain usually at the thumb. This is uh, especially when you try to pinch something or you try to hold up a cup. So there are many names to, to this. Mama thumb is one of them. Mama so or PlayStation thumb or Blackberry thumb or iPhone or Samsung thumb, uh, depending on what phone you use. Um, so the net the, the problem is at the first dorsal compartment of the extensor tendons. Um, so the, the tendons, the two tendons that are involved are EPV and APL. They get constricted here and they become swollen and become edematous. 
So again, um, this is a Finkelstein's test where you ask the patient to keep the thumb inside the, the palm and you ask them to flex the wrist downwards ultimately. And the pain is very typical at that area, at where the tendon, uh, APL and EPB tendons are. And it's right at the radial styloid, if you know how to look, look for it. Um, it's really tender. You press that one particular area and that's very, very painful. And that's the typical di uh, diagnostic uh, way. So how do we treat them? Um, usually, most patients can, can, can be treated with conservative splinting and some and steroid injections. Uh, and of course, if those people who fail, uh, we do surgery as well. So I would say in my practice, uh, most patients, if they come early enough, uh, conservative treatment of splinting and steroid injections combined, uh, about 90% will resolve without needing surgery. So about 10% need surgery. But during this period of uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, steroid injections, uh, uh, I, I have a conversation about um, risk for, for immunosuppression with, with steroid injections. So sometimes when people hear about uh, the risk, then they don't want any more steroid injections. So we just treat them with splinting. Um, again, splint like this. So this splint is different. Um, it immobilizes the thumb. So just don't just give them a wrist splint. Uh, those are useless for, for decrevance. So you need to immobilize the thumb. Again, um, um, uh, we have custom-made spleen for this as well. This is uh, quite quite uh, bulky. We can make custom-made ones that are smaller. So you can inject steroids. Uh, please remember to tell your patient that there is a small risk of hypopigmentation and fat necrosis around this area. Why I tell you that? Because someone in Singapore, an orthopedic surgeon, forgot to tell that to their patient, to his patient, and he was fined one hundred thousand sing dollar. So please tell them if you're going to inject them that that is a common problem, especially if the patient is has dark skin, because the the white patch can be very very prominent and very disfiguring to to some. But usually they are they are self limiting. They they the the pigment uh, will come back uh, with time, but it may take a few months before that happens. Yeah, so, why, why does the steroid cause a uh, hypopigmentation? Because the steroids goes up to the skin and cause uh, I don't know what they do the 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 melanin uh, the the the, the cells. Yeah, so they 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 actually thin out the skin. So steroids in the fat tissue will cause fat necrosis. So the skin actually thins out. Uh, it can cause a, a bit of irritation on the skin. That, that you can see that the skin is thin, and also you can you the 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 the, the, the they lose the pigment. So in a Chinese or or, or white uh, population, that's not a big deal. But if you have a, a Indian population or a, or a black guy, then it's very very uh, prominent. It's disfiguring sometimes. And is it with steroid injection at this particular spot or it can happen in any other with steroid? Oh, it can, it can happen in any part. I have seen a patient with a tennis elbow uh, injected by someone, uh, not the right way of injecting. And she came to see me with a long sleeve uh, is sitting in my clinic. Then I asked her, what's wrong with you? And then she pulled up her sleeve and the the it's a woman, uh, it's a lady, and uh, she got so much fat necrosis, you can literally see ev all the the extensor tendon muscles. It's horrible. Uh, you can see it's like a uh, uh, corpse. Uh, all the muscle uh, fibers, because the the fat necrosis thin out all the the skin over the whole entire forearm. So you can literally see every fiber of the muscle. So it's horrible. So, and I think the, the, the person who injected the steroid didn't inject it into the right area, injected underneath the skin, that's it. They didn't inject into the epicondyle. So, if you want to inject steroids, um, please inject it properly uh, and, uh, and, and know where you are, what you are dealing with, or else you're going to get a lot of problems to our patient. And nowadays, our patients are not very forgiving. Uh, they will sue us. Yeah. So, this is a surgical release. So, basically, you... Again, this done the local anesthesia, you can just cut it and you release the, the retinaculum. So the problem with this surgery is there's a nerve, the superficial radial nerve that runs up here, 
not careful, you're going to cut it and cause numbness to this area and pain. And the other thing is the, the APL and EPB, although it's supposed to be in one same compartment, but sometimes they can be in two different compartments. So you have to make sure that when you release, you release them both. And also sometimes the APL can have two slips. Then you think that you already release both uh, APL and EPB, but then you actually only release the APL. So these are problems that uh, some of the complications we see that after release, they don't, they still have a lot of pain. Then on revision, you see that uh, um, that EPB is not, not fully, not released. It's still in the compartment and still in plane. And that's why some of the patients also fail steroid injection because when you inject steroids, you only inject into one compartment and the sub compartment doesn't get uh, the steroid. So that's why the pain is still there. All right. Tennis elbow. So I'm going to be very quick. So this is pain in the 45 minutes already. Huh? So, so symptoms on the pain on the outside of the elbow, pain on elbow expansion, pain on squeezing or, or, or squeezing the mop of cloth. So basically you have microscopic tear over the extensor tendons. And if you ask the patient to extend the fingers or extend the wrist, they will tell you it's painful on the lateral epicondyle. Sometimes if it's early, they don't get pain on the lateral epicondyle. They just tell you that it's icky around here, the extensor muscles. Um, if you ask them to, to, to hold up a, a bottle of water using just their fingers, that also can be very painful or try to get a, a grab their a notebook out from the from the back, that can be painful. That's a typical uh, story of tennis elbow. So treatment, again, we can give a, a steroid injection. We give you a tennis elbow strap. And lastly, we do surgery. So how, how does the tennis elbow strap uh, work? I tell patient, this is the muscle. And there's already a tear here. So every time you move your wrist or your extend, you extend your wrist or flex your wrist or extend your fingers, this will pull onto the uh, muscle attachment of the extensor muscle. So by putting a strap around here, you avoid that being pulled and avoid pressure to that area and tearing it further. So that reduces the pull and that allows the tendon to heal. And just giving a steroid injection, that will reduce the, 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 the pain quicker. But the steroid injection actually doesn't help with healing. Um, in many countries in the Scandinavia, they don't do steroid injection anymore because um, the, the, the data is that um, steroid injection actually doesn't help healing. So, and, and they have shown that uh, we just strap, um, um, they can heal on their own and heal better sometimes. So the steroid injection can actually uh, prolong healing uh, time. But uh, steroid injection is effective to, to take away the symptoms faster. So some patients will still want the steroid injection. There are people who inject uh, PRP into this area. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, I've done a, a couple of patients like that. They In my hands, they don't turn up very well. So, yeah. What is PRP? Uh, uh, plasma rich, uh, oh, platelet rich plasma. So, so some people just tell them it's a uh, stem cell, but it's actually not stem cells. They are PRP. So it's just basically you withdraw twenty centimeter, uh, twenty cc's of blood. You put it in a centrifuge. You spin it, and then you just take out the 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 uh, the the tops of uh, uh, plasma that is uh, rich of platelets. They use and it a lot for aesthetic. Right. Yes, correct. And they are expensive and they are not covered by insurance. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um one, eight, one is not moving. Okay, so that's the steroid injection. So that's tennis elbow release. So what you do is uh local anesthesia around this area, that's the media condal and make a skin incision like that. I open up, I see the 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 extensor insertion. This is the ECRB or extensor carpi uh, radialis brevis. So this is the area that is attached to the, to the, te to the lateral epicondyle. That area is inflamed and painful. So what we do, what I do is, um, I ronger away all the, the, the unhealthy tissue. Uh, if you re remember, I said the, there's a microscopic tear around the area and they're trying to heal and so it doesn't want to heal. 
So what we do is we try to stimulate new growth by cleaning up the inflamed tissue and release the ECRB and then we stitch them back. And uh, day three post-op, the patient will tell you the pain is so much better. Uh, although well, there's just, no Basically, there's nothing to repair. Just clean it up. Clean it up and then I repair back whatever I cut, uh, basically. Some people yeah, actually but... make a make a make a um, anchor suture and anchor suture it down, but uh, I don't find that useful at all. And uh, that's another extra two thousand bucks just for an anchor suture for nothing. So most patients doesn't need that. I don't do that, and, and I don't find any uh, weakness in their hand or wrist uh, extension at all. So I don't do that. I just stitch back basically the whatever muscle I cut uh, to get to the ECRB. Golfer's elbow is the same thing, same pathology, only on the media epicondyle, but you don't need to play golf to get golfer's elbow. I'm sure you know that. So some common mistakes that uh, I find um, during my practice that people put patients on are oral steroids for carpal tunnel, oral steroids for cubital tunnel, oral steroids for trigger finger. I think this is something that you should not do. Okay, I think this is not right. It's not the, the correct thing to do because um, especially in this era, in, in, in the COVID-19 era, you're just putting patients at risk for infection. Gabapentin or uh, Lyrica for, for pain, for nerve pain. Um, for carpal tunnel and uh, cubital tunnel, I think we have very good uh, treatment. We either conservatively or, 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 or surgically and the risk for surgeries is uh, negligible compared to if you have a nerve pain from the you know, cervical uh, problems and you don't want to go through a, a nerve, uh, nerve surgery or nerve uh, spine surgery, then you put them on Lyrica and Gabapentin and things like that because nobody actually know how this uh, Gabapentin and Lyrica works. Um, there are some studies to show that they actually can cause uh, nerve degeneration. So be very careful about putting this because uh, the, the pretty lady from Pfizer will come and ask you to use this for their patients. And I keep telling them, please do not sell Lyrica for for carpal tunnel, uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome, and the drugs are not cheap. You know, it's few hundred bucks per month, um, and they don't work like pain medication. And the patients sometimes just take them by pain medications. Uh, oh, I only take them when I have pain. Uh, it doesn't work like that. You, you have to be on it for a long time. I know that because my mom takes it for for her back, uh, uh, her chronic uh, 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 scoliosis, uh, degenerative scoliosis that causes no pain in the leg. She doesn't want surgery, so so she's she's on it. So that that will take months uh, to work. You, you need to take it long 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 term. So don't put your patient on carbapentin or or Lyrica for carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel syndrome. And, and for face, uh, face can increase the QT uh, interval in some patients and cause people uh, patients to go into uh, torsad and cause sudden death. Yeah, so again, <laughs> okay. so if you do all this, you also need to monitor the liver function or else uh, they, they may go into liver problems as well. So pace is another thing. Uh, people like to do this. They give pepes and tell them, oh, you, that will reduce your swelling. Actually, uh, in my practice, I don't see that working at all. Uh, some plastic surgeon likes to do that to give uh, patients for post-op uh, swelling. Again, I don't use them and I don't see any problems with them. So I think it's a uh, uh, not useful drug for, for all these swelling things. And NSAIDs, NSAIDs do work, but uh, be careful again, um, prolonged use of NSAIDs can cause uh, uh, upper GI bleed. And even with the COX-2s, uh, you know, although uh, Cerebex uh, seems to be safe, but things like acoxia can cause trouble. So the, our old uh, COX-2 Vioxx has been removed for those reasons. Yeah, So increased cardiovascular risk for prolonged use. So those pains that, um, those muscular skeletal pains are usually prolonged. And, and one, two doses of NSAIDs, uh, Every day for the rest of their life is not not safe. All right, short period of time, yes, it, it works, but uh, not for a prolonged period of time. Um, bony problems. Uh, so distal radius fracture this is a wrist fracture. I just want to talk about colis fracture because this is something that uh, uh, I think not many people do this. Uh, you can fix this. You can treat this. 
conservatively like this with a cast looks horrible six weeks four to six weeks in a cast like this you remove the cast and the and the wrist is super swollen super edematous uh they can get into crps and the uh, loss of function especially in the old ladies yeah uh, they they cannot tolerate this for a long period of time they will lose function and lose lose uh, a lot of uh, and create a lot of problems for them so how do i do that now i do this under local anesthesia this is a Colis fracture that I fixed with four wires. So if you can see, there are four wires there. This is in the operating room. She's moving on her own. And you can see the fracture is already stable by just four wires. And you can see this is a really, this is actually an unstable type fracture because the ulnar styloid is also fractured. So, but that's good enough for an old lady. For a young man, you want you don't want to do this, you want to put a plate. You can see this is the ulnar on a steroid fracture. So this is a very unstable uh, distal, uh, wrist fracture, uh, distal radius with on a styloid. So by just putting four pins like that, this can be done under local anesthesia. So if you are you know, old ladies, they have multiple medical problems that may not tolerate GA very well. You don't want to put a plate. You can just put four pins like that. Um, during the pandemic, I actually have a, a Pfizer lady who, whose father-in-law had a fracture like this. He has a much worse fracture here a very bad fracture here and also a fracture of the ulna head. He refuses uh, plates. I told him, I said, look, I think I better put you on a plate, but uh, put a plate in. He doesn't want. He said, no, 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 doctor, you're not doing that for me. I'm scared of this COVID. Please do something else. So I pin him and, 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 and to my surprise, even with that unstable fracture, we managed to uh, get him well and he, he, he's got nearly full range of motion of the wrist after all. So this is a patient of mine that I put on. That's the same patient that you saw the, the I, I, I photos, child photos just now. This is the pins that is jutting out. So what that happens is this pin is really is pinned into the fracture and also the normal bone. So you can see she is already moving day three. That's her two weeks after surgery. You can see the pin being um, um, uh, dressed. Of course, she goes home with a, a, a splint, uh, is, a, is a back slap. So this she don't go home like this, huh? so 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 she still have a back slap. But the pin is uh, the outside. pin is, is uh, put, protruding, protruding out. Protruding, yes, correct. So that's why we need to do pin track dressing like that. So she comes back to the, the clinic every week for me to change and make sure it doesn't get infected. So one of the problems is uh, pin track infection. So so we need to avoid that. Huh? So so those are problems. So this is two weeks after surgery. You can see she's already moving her her wrist. Is pretty stable with a pin, all right. So those four pins actually allows her to do this without much pain, all right. That's her in the clinic at two weeks, and you can see she can move to most of the. It's not perfect, but this is better than in a full cast with no motion at all. So she can she can actually do that. Um, the inventor inventor of this. He's a French guy and he, he actually allows the patient to go home with the normal spleen that they can remove on their own. Uh, our patients, I, I just put them on backstab and tell them not, not to move it. So when they come to change their pin track and change their backstab every week, I allow them to move for a short while so that they don't get into stiffness. So this four weeks after surgery, I remove the pin four to six weeks depending on the x-rays. So if the x-ray looks good, then I remove them a bit earlier. If the x-ray don't look so good, I remove that at six weeks. So that's just the holes from the pin. Okay. You just yank it out. Uh yes, <laughs> sort of. We 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 do we just cut the wire and then pull it out. Yes. So that's that's her two months post-op. Three months post-op. This is the video I just show you. So you can see she can move much faster now. No more pins there. You can't hardly see where the sky is just there. So this can be done in the local. So so this is why why I think this is a good good uh, technique. So last stop skier stump. I think we already ten o'clock. <laughs> so yeah. I'm gonna go through this very quickly. So we I think one of the case that we talk about uh in the telegram was a uh, uh, so called uh uh. uh Thumb injury. So this patient is actually a plastic surgeon's uh, cousin who came to see me after skiing in uh, in, in Japan. So she fell down from uh, hold, while holding a ski pole and she ruptured her ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb. Can you see that? I can actually push the thumb out. 
this is uh, under anesthesia. This is not in the clinic. So if you do not do that on a, on a patient without anesthesia, they will punch you in the face. So if you can see, it's totally out, okay? And if you see the X-ray, you can see that <laughs> it's totally out, all right? So there's a ligament here called the ulnar collateral ligament that has been uh, ruptured. So I just show you, this is how we do it. That's the, the, the ruptured uh, tendon. Um, what I did for her for this is I put it back and then I put an anchor suture and then stitch this down. So this is intra-op after I repair to test how, how good it is. You see, it's pretty stable now. I cannot sublux it anymore. So this is how it is. Mm. Okay, how do you get this skiers fracture? So if you fall down with the pole, this force from, from the ski pole is going to push your thumb outwards. Uh, okay. So that ruptures the, the, the thing. So the, 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 the difference between gamekeeper and, and, and skier's thumb is actually the same thing. It's, it's a skier's, it's a, it's a ulnar collateral ligament injury. So skier's thumb is an acute injury from either a fall or trauma or accident. But in gamekeeper, gamekeeper is an ulnar collateral ligament uh, injury that is chronic. So why, why is it called gamekeeper? Because the gamekeeper used to break the, the, the foul and the, and the, and the, and the game that they, 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 they catch or they shoot and they kill them by putting the chicken or the fowl here and then using the thumb to break the neck of the, the oh, fowl. Okay. So that causes uh, laxity of the ulnar collateral ligament over time. So that's a chronic injury, not a acute injury. So the patient that you, we, that you had that day um, in, the, in the telegram uh, message was... Uh, uh, a, a motor vehicle accident or something, some kind like that, okay. right, or a fall. So that is a skier's thumb rather than game keeper's thumb. So the treatment is slightly different. Uh. So in an acute one, you want to repair them uh, so then they can get a uh, good, good uh, outcome. And you can see this, that's her um, nearly six months post-op. You can see that this is the hand that is injured. You can see the abduction. It's not full. This is this normal hand, but that's pretty good for, for uh, skier's thumb. Okay, the question was the, the this 25 year old right hand dominant trip and fell on the mm. and fell on her right thumb. Mm. And then pain was when she flexed her right thumb, mm. unable to write or grip things tightly. Yeah. Yeah. So that can be anything, but uh, we need to examine and, and, and do some x rays or MRI and, and, and ultrasound. But this patient, uh, actually didn't need to do that because when she come back, she came back with a typical history how the thumb uh, was uh, pushed by the by the you know, uh, the ski pole and uh, we already know that's the diagnosis. Uh, so I, I only gave her some injection wrist block on the clinic in the clinic and I did uh, the, the abduction. So this is her again. This is to show you how stable it is post-op. So this is a post-op stability. So, so this is basically a, all uh, soft tissue or tendon kind of injuries. La, yes, not yes. Bony. ligament injury. La. This is a ligament injury. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. So I think that's the last slide. Any questions? I think I already passed one hour. So I think I'm not going to go yeah, through the I second think the, part. Um, the next session when we bring back uh, the Sunway to give talk again, you can give the other other sure. session. Uh -huh. Sure, sure. Because it's been so long. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Maybe you okay, this is uh your website? This is my Facebook page, yes. Our clinic Facebook page. Oh, you can scan one. Uh. How do you do this scan? Uh? I also want to do uh. this one I not done by me, done by my nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do Facebook, actually. I don't know how to do Facebook. I see. Okay, I so uh, stuff, uh, um, okay, you stop sharing. Let me help. Yeah. Uh, let me share the the QR uh, code. Okay. Where is it now? Sorry. Um. Okay, I just this. Stop share. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Done. 
Let me see where is my thing now. Hold on now, guys. Let me just do this. Okay, so um, there are some questions. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. Denise Sim says that she has seen intralesional syncord injection that causes the um, the necrosis also. Yep. Okay. And then I think if you open the thing, okay, is steroid injection safe for um, safe for in pregnancy? Yes, it's safe for pregnancy. No, 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 no trouble at all. Again, um, steroid injection with this, uh, the problem is, is COVID-19. Uh, um, there is a, you know, it, earlier on in February, uh, March, uh, when uh, last year, um, I, all the patients that comes in with all this trigger finger, carpal tunnel, I just, just, shoot them off by giving them steroid injection. Don't even bother to tell them do therapy because they have to come back. So that, that increases the risk of, uh, things, uh, of, of, of contact, right? So I just wanted to give them steroid injection and ask them go home and don't come back until you really cannot come, uh, a lot of pain, then you come back. But then we had, uh, uh, I, I attended a webinar uh, among the, some hand surgeons in, in, in around the world and, and the, one of the British surgeon shared that um, in, in the UK, they, they actually, uh, the hand society actually uh, tell their members to, to give steroid injection with caution. I was like, huh? Now, now how? We cannot do surgery. We cannot give steroid injection. No, what do we do with our patients? So he said, oh, no, it's not contraindicated, but you know, you will need to talk to your patient about it. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, so it's a... It's a problem. Uh. So when you talk to patient, then you know, one patient here that uh, you are in, you just increase my risk for 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 COVID nineteen. I'm not going to take that. No, please don't do this for me. So yeah, so yeah, you know, fix uh. So usually this one whole year, my my treatment regime is very simple. I treat you conservatively with spleen therapy until you tabulate tahan. Then I cut you up. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Somebody asked whether it is is it. A, are we able to prevent onset of tri trigger finger? Well, um, unfortunately, no. If I know, if you, if I know, I wouldn't have trigger finger myself. So I am having trigger finger now. <laughs> okay. Is skier's thumb in skier's thumb? How soon would you do surgery? Skier's thumb, um, if it is unstable like th that, immediately. <laughs> do not wait. It will not heal. It will so, not heal. Yeah, you will not heal. So if unstable like that, you want to do it right away. And gamekeeper, can we wait and treat it conservatively? Gamekeeper, you need to come and we need to see how uh, unstable it is. Uh. So if it's very unstable and it's very, it's very symptomatic, um, we probably need to do some surgery. Uh. But we can treat it with spleen as well. But uh, splinting sometimes is still very lax. The ligament is already very lax. Then, then of course the, the thing may not uh, yeah may not help so you need to tighten it up. Okay, hold on. Uh. This is um sorry uh. this slide is okay. This is the correct one. So Serena asked immediately or after swelling subsides. I am not sure what she's asking about because she said immediately or after swelling subsides. What if there is a cheap fracture of the base of the proximal phalanx involved? So do you, can you? Okay, so, so I don't know what the question is about, but if you see a chip fracture on any bone of the finger, uh, you, you should send it to a, 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 if it is in the finger, you send it to us, la, to, to, to a hand surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or so, so that we can assess it properly. Because a lot of, uh, this chip fracture can be anything. It can be a ruptured flexor tendon, uh, a valve ruptured ten, uh, flexor tendon. It can be a, a valve uh, uh, ligament, collateral ligament, like you know the 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 skier stump that I shared. Um, so all these things uh, should not be. Take okay, uh, Mish. Okay, Kai asked, Just "How do you do steroid injection for trigger finger? Maybe you can. Maybe I think that 
we need a workshop. La. Yeah, unfortunately, you need a workshop. So it's very hard to, to, to describe to you. Um, you want to do it in the ten, flexor tendon sheath. You do not want to sway your needle at the side of the finger where the neurovascular bundles are because you're going to injure the nerve or, or inject the steroids into the digital artery and then cause a finger necrosis. You want to inject it into the where the tendon is, but not into the tendon. You need to go into the sheath. Uh, how do you know that? I feel. <laughs> so, a bit Very difficult to describe, yeah. unfortunately. So, yeah. Michelle asked, does tre daily treatment worsen the prognosis of skier's thumb? Of course. Because what happens is, uh, uh, delayed treatment can cause stiffness. And then ultimately, the ligament that is on the that is ruptured is going to shrink and shorten, and that's when we have no tissue to stitch on, or the tissue are so um, fab uh, fibrosis or, or or fragile that you cannot stitch properly. So the ligament cannot be stitched up properly. So you want to treat them as soon as possible. Okay, yeah. Serena's question was actually pertaining to skier's thumb. Can we take some questions from Facebook? Yeah. Elaine Yen asks, um, can carpal tunnel syndrome reoccur after surgery? It can. Um, there are two types of recurrence, uh, carpal tunnel, uh, so-called carpal tunnel recurrence. Uh. Um, one is the type where actually the treatment was the wrong, wrong treatment. So the diagnosis is wrong. It's not carpal tunnel syndrome. It's some other issue. So we do a carpal tunnel release and show sure the patient doesn't have any relief. Then there's the carpal tunnel where is a real, is diagnosis is correct, but the surgeon didn't release the carpal tunnel properly. They didn't release the ligament properly. So there is still some fib uh, fibers that is not released. So uh, one of the things that people uh, in open carpal tunnel release uh, common mistakes is they, the, the, the surgeon or the trainee surgeon thinks the, the, um, um, they have released the, the, the tunnel, the, the ligament prop, uh, uh, proper, but they have not. They only release the, the super uh, palma fascia, which is not the transverse carpal ligament. So, of course, they, the patient will still have impingement. No? So, that is a so-called uh, inadequate release or wrongly diagnosed uh, recurrent carpal tunnel. So then but if it's done properly? Yes, it can recur, but rarely. Um, so, that, that's the, the one that I'm going to talk about. Is mm. I've seen a few patients when I was in UM and patients in their 60s who comes back and say that now I have numbness, I was released by... Professor so and so, who is not here and not there anymore, they uh, really left or they have passed. And 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 you look at the hand, there's a scar there that is uh, they hardly can be seen. And then they tell you that uh, uh, your professor uh, released me twenty years ago, and now is is back. So then we do we do we we do them. Now. So and then there is a uh, the type those patients we may need not we may not only just need to release, we may need to do some sort of uh, neurolysis and we may need to do a fat pad uh, wrapping of the, of, the, uh, the, of the median nerve because usually these nerves are quite scarred already. Yeah. So you, yes. You, 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 uh, you. And she asked that uh, how long would the steroid, Elaine also asked, how long would the steroid work uh, or subside, the effect subside for trigger fingers? So, okay, after, maybe I answer it this way. Huh? So, so, if you give a steroid injection to, for trigger finger, how fast does it work? So, I have a colleague in, when I was uh, training in Singapore, we did a study and the study says after injection at about two weeks, about 20% uh, of patients would have uh, relief of symptoms, all right? And then at six weeks, about 80% would have uh, relief of symptoms, 20% will fail, 20% will need to go through surgery again, uh, to go through surgery. And um, then there is unfortunately no answer as to how long that will last. My, my personal uh, experience with steroid injection is, I think about 50% may fail, especially those who are elderly and those who use their hand to do a lot of stuff. So um, a lot of times, 
it may last, you may fail at about six months. It may come back at six months. So yeah. So if they, they recur at six months, I usually tell them, I can give you another injection, no issue, but then the chances of it recurring again is very, very high. So if you don't want to come back every six months for me to give you an injection, then let's do the release. So then, then you don't need to come back to see me every six months. Okay, another Dr. Tay, I don't know whether you, if you know him, Dr. Tay Johan says hi to you. Hi. Um, you know Tay Johan from Sarawak? I vaguely remember the name, but I cannot remember the, the, the face. Oh, I see. Yeah. So Tay Johan is actually my cousin. He's the... Ah. Uh, yeah, he he say hi, Kok King means he knows hi. you. Okay. Um, Zian Lim asks, okay, what is your view on vitamin B12, which you have already answered? Okay. So basically, we have replied almost all questions. We have replied all questions. But Michelle just um, asked another question. Sure. If for skier's thumb surgery, can orthopedic do the surgery too? Does it need to be hand surgeon? Um, <laughs> million dollar question. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to um, <laughs> say things that will hurt my orthopedic colleagues. Uh, um, and and I think That's most exactly. most. Okay, okay, let me answer. Okay, uh, a lot. Sometimes hand surgeons also uh, do. Um, general orthopedic in a private sector, especially when they started start coming out because it basically provides income. Uh, but of course, uh, most times anything to do with the hands, preferably uh, if you have a subspecial subspecial specialist, then we would send to the subspecialist. If you so, do not have, then of course we have no choice, lah, right? Yeah. So 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 just to answer that question on my on my part, I I I don't do any general orthopedics at all. I only do hand surgery, and that's you because don't I work. Did, yeah. Oh, I no, see. I don't do I don't do lower limbs at all. Okay, I don't do lower limbs. I don't do uh, uh lower limbs fractures at all. I don't also do shoulder fractures anymore. So these are things that uh, we give up. Uh, as we sub-specialize and, and I'm, I'm fortunate because I work in a tertiary hospital where I can survive just doing hand surgery so yeah. I'm not condemning people who are doing multiple stuff but, uh, but that's the, the entire practice unfortunately um, sometimes uh, yeah you, you, you are forced to do certain things uh, so because sometimes patients come and request for you can, I, can you please do this for me you know your mother, my mother see you your, they, they trust you uh, so so a lot of times, uh, for things that I'm not comfortable doing, or I don't do very much, I tell them, go see my colleague who is better than me. So that's how I practice. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Next week, we have another talk also by a consultant from Sunway with one CPD points. It will be on gastroenterology. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Tay. Uh, I hope to get you back for the second uh, session on your sure sure uh, your second part of your talk. It's been yep. quite a very good talk. I'm thank very you. happy. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you thank guys. You. Bye. Thank you guys, bye bye. Thank okay, you. Have a good bye. week ahead. Stay safe. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kok King. Thanks, thanks, Betty. Thanks. Yes. Thanks, Amy. Bye. Amy, bye. bye. Thanks, thanks.